I'm about 40 kilometres south of Hobart with my good friend Nicole Gillibar from Granby. How are you, Nicole? Good, Sam. <laughs> good, Thank excellent. You. Great. I'm always great. Uh -huh. um, beautiful part of the world. It's amazing. And for anybody who uh, out there, you've got to come and visit Granby. So tell me about Granby. What do you what do you do, and why do you do it? Huh. Okay, so Grandview next year hits 20 years old. Wow, yeah. that's so pretty fantastic. Small family owned and operated business, 40k south of Hobart. We started with a sheep dairy. Um, we farm sheep, milk them, make cheese. Cheese produces whey, whey produces alcohol, so you turn that into booze. Um, so the whole reason we do what we do is to talk to people in a space that feels common and familiar to give it a bit of a shake up you know <laughs> challenge their belief systems around what milk is where it comes from how it's processed what way is what it should and shouldn't be can and can't be all of those kinds of things so whilst we produce predominantly cheese mm -hmm. and vodka and gin what we don't do is take common sources of ferment for the gin or vodka common sources of milk for the cheese. Um, we choose instead to have a slightly different conversation around the way we go about those things. Yeah, yeah, yep. certainly. So the styles of cheeses, firstly, they're all sheep milk. All sheep milk. So why did you decide to go with sheep? So again, what rolls us out of bed and what really enthuses us is challenging ourselves to create an extension of, I guess, a, a belief system. So for us, I mean, you've seen the property, it looks green at the moment, that's because we've had huge amounts of rain, but you could never sustain cattle on this property. Mm. Um, goats for us weren't really going to challenge us enough because that space was starting to become, um, you know, quite well occupied by other people. And we thought, well, there's not many people making sheep milk cheese. Um, sheep milk also has um, greater nutrient density per litre. Um, we thought that there was a lot of scope for people who needed functional foods um, to, you know, um, provide them with an alternative to um, and dairy. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we we tend to take the paths less. Travel. <laughs> you certainly do. <laughs> um, and that's kind of, I guess, the, the short version of why we chose sheep. Um, if we didn't, I don't think it would sustain our interest in the same way that it has for the last 20 years. Yeah, certainly. Now, the style of cheese is, is quite a European style mm -hmm. um, that runs through a lot, of your, a lot of your cheeses. Let's run through some of them because they are, firstly, they're beautiful. Um, but yeah, let's share sort of what we've, what we've got. So we've got Sapphire Blue. Yep. Um, this cheese we've been making since we started making cheese. Even 20 years in, um, it is the most challenging cheese we make. Why is that? Because it fluctuates. Oh, does it? So it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to make blue cheese well, particularly in an artisan environment. Yeah. So, um, you know, I always say with cheese, making half your battle is getting quality milk, but well, once you've got that, the subsequent battle is paying attention to that and, yeah. and taking the subtle cues that you need to um, observe to actually come out the other end with a cheese that's that's really um, delicious. So blue challenges that on a multitude of fronts. You've got two surface areas doing the maturation. Yep. So you've got one that you can't see and one that you can see. The yeah. one that you can't see is the one that pulls you the most drama. Yeah, okay. So, it's on um, the inside. Yeah, it's it's intellectually um, very engaging <laughs> to make and mature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we've got our drunken admiral, and yep. this is this is a, a beautiful little cheese. Um, tell me about this. So this is essentially a, a manchego recipe that we matured recently. So yep. it's a very young manchego. It's about three months old. Um, manchego is commonly imported now, and I think a lot of people understand what the Spanish origins are of the cheese. Yep. Um, we make this in spring. It comes from a cheese that we call Primavera. Um, now, what a lot of people don't realise with sheep is that sheep only lactate for seven months of the year. Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot about seasonality in everything we do. And spring milk 
is profoundly different to summer milk, which is profoundly different to autumn milk. Yeah. So stylistically, we typically only make this particular cheese with spring milk. Um, this young Primavera gets a wine soak in local Dornfelder wines. Um, oh, not right. many people have heard of that variety, no. but it gives that really intense yeah. purple hue. Beautiful looking cheese. You drink too much of that Dornfelder wine and you see it on your teeth for days. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll make sure I stay away from that one then. Um, okay, so this one here, Gin Herbalist. Uh, this has been always been a really popular cheese through uh, through Artisan's Bend. Tell me about this one. What firstly, the cheese that you start with is this also the Primavera? No. 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 Um, that is actually the cheese that the girls are making currently. You yeah. guys can't see that, but they're actually making cheese. Yes. Yeah. All of about five meters that way. Yeah. Um, so we only make this with summer milk. Now summer for us is a, a point in time. Mm -hmm. For milk, it's actually a point in solids differentiation. Okay. So when fats start to go up and proteins start to go up, that tells us that the milk has changed from spring milk to summer milk. The spring milk is lower in solids, lower in fat and protein. So we use that as um, the delineation between when spring ends and summer starts. Yeah. When summer starts, we start making gin herbalist and a suite of other cheeses um, because that milk property is much better suited to this style. Okay. So essentially, gin herbalist is the best um, cheese-related example that we have of our philosophy of face not whatnot. not. Yeah. Um, so we developed this cheese, or rather I should say Emma, who's actually making cheese at the moment, um, as a solution to a problem and a way of demonstrating who we are and why we do what we do. So yeah. we make the cheese, it's deliberately, reasonably sort of lactic and neutral. It's mm -hmm. not it's not definitively yeah. anything really. Yeah. Um, and it's a vehicle for flavour, so it's a vehicle for the spent gin botanicals from the distillery which is directly beneath our feet. Um, and we use the Way from this cheese to ferment and distill. The distillers then turn that into vodka, then they turn that into gin. The gin provides us with waste botanicals, which then come back upstairs, showed you earlier. They sit in the bag and wait to be stuck to the outside of this cheese. So um, it really was and really is the, the best lactic demonstration of how we think. Oh, wow. That's very cool. I hope so. <laughs> All right, then. Let's move on to the last one that we've got here. So this is the old man. <coughs> old man. The and old man. So why is it called old man? So the old man is called the old man because it's sweet and nutty. <laughs> yes. And semi hard. Okay. <laughs> um, semi hard, sweet and nutty. That's an sounds, old man. Sounds a bit crass, but yeah. <laughs> the reality of being a domestic cheese maker is that we can't actually just take a recipe and stick a European name on it like we used to. Yeah. You know, in wine times there was Hunter River Burgundy, etc, etc, etc. Well, it's the same in the cheese world. We can't just do that anymore. Yeah. So, um, the best way we can get people to relate to new names in cheeses is to make them a bit quirky and a bit funny. And to mm. be honest, we don't take things too seriously anyway. No. So, um, cheese can get a little bit technical and... Um, no, it can be difficult to understand, um, but that's not what we aim to do. We want cheeses that are relatable, um, and whether that's giving it a quirky name or sticking something weird on the outside or making something that everyone knows and loves anyway, yep. that's kind of where we try and hedge our bets. Yeah, okay. Um, so where do you see the future of Grandview? Um, well, look, we hit 20 years next year. We've um, taken the opportunity the last year and a half to rethink about what we do in tourism here. Yep. So um, we think we can deliver greater value to people who visit us by offering experiences mm -hmm. rather than the ubiquitous syllable cafe. Yes. Um, so that's what we'll do here um, with regards to the cheese factory. We've got two brands making new apprentices. So we'll nice. get them across what we're doing and then um, hopefully in the next 12 to 24 months will extend the factory um, so we are in close focus space in there um, so that's that's kind of what we're doing there and then the distillery is already underway yeah. the 
good one. Well, there you have it. So, if you want to come down and visit, we're about 40 kilometres south of Hobart in a place called Birches Bay. It is an absolutely stunning place. Uh, and certainly, as Nicole was saying, come for a, an amazing experience. Uh, and all of Nicole's cheeses you'll find on Artisan's Bend. Nicole, thank you very much. It's Pleasure. been great. Awesome.